We have come to the end of this semester. This was an exceptionally difficult semester. It will be known in our archives, in our minds, as the COVID-19 2020 semester. We tried to salvage it as much as we can with these online lectures and the PowerPoint presentations. And the last reading for this semester is the masterpiece of the German author Goethe, Faust. Uh, at the very beginning of the semester on the syllabus, uh, the title of the course was From the Rise of Christianity to the Romantic Age. We understand what is Christianity, we went through it. Uh, the Romantic Age, maybe, is something that is a bit more difficult for you to understand. Maybe when you think of Romantic, you think of music, you think of dinner with candlelight and uh, somebody playing on the violin. But actually, uh, the Romantic uh, or Romanticism uh, was a movement that uh, aimed, basically, it started in the mid of the 18th, from 18th to the mid 19th century. And it was just a movement that wanted to go back to nature, to get away with all this extremely uh, reason-oriented uh, philosophies and, and concepts and return to homo natura, not the homo sapien, the man who knows, but the man who feels and emotions and passion and love. Uh, we see this very much in art, we see this very much in literature, in drawings, William Blake, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, and this, this movement of liberation, a little bit of folly, a little bit of craziness. And it also continues in your next semester, we'll see it in Gibran, Khalil Gibran, we'll see it in some works of uh, uh, Nietzsche returning to the uh, man as a na nature uh, product rather than a reason product. Okay, let's go back a little bit to Goethe. Goethe uh, was this famous German philosopher. Uh, he's a poet, writer, not a philosopher, but actually there's a lot of philosophy in his work. And uh, he died in 1832, uh, 1749 to 1832. Uh, he wrote this book over more than 50 years, so uh, one can imagine a work that goes over more than half a century, uh, how much there is a mirror and a reflection of the author and the age uh, in this work. Now, uh, the book, which is called Faust, which is based on the British um, English Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, is in fact a a very interesting, it is, we have two volumes, Faust I and Faust II. We will do more of Faust I, very little of Faust II, except for the last part, which is when, when, when Faust uh, dies. And if one wants to really understand what the story is all about, uh, I just want you to think of the story of Job in the Old Testament, Ayub, and sometimes the patience of Job. And if we just want to recollect a little bit the story of Job, it is when Satan, the devil, approached with the angels Gog and, uh, and he wanted to sort of uh, divert one of the uh, good followers of God from the path of, uh, of God and uh, he chose Job to test him and that was by offering or, 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 or uh, uh, throwing one calamity over the other on Job. First he took his cattle, then he took his uh, uh, fields, and then the children. And then, so at the end, Job was left with nothing, a very rich man, a very, very, and, and, and yet at every step, he praised the Lord. He never gave up, he never, uh, he never blasphemed, he never rejected God. And he remained, so this pact between God and the devil about whether uh, Job can be diverted from the straight path was through the suffering. In this story, in the story of Faust, which is not very different again, and we shall see as we go through the pacts, uh, it is a pact between uh, the devil and God, 
Uh, the devil is called here Mephistopheles, Mephisto. He's an extremely uh, sophisticated gentleman who appears always with a, with a cane and a three-piece suit sort of a thing, you know, and uh, who uh, in the prologue uh, approaches God and says, oh, you know, he says, first of all, you know, he is an ex-angel because he's a fallen angel. So he approaches God and he tells uh, the boss, you know, he calls him the boss, you know, he says, you know, I'm, I'm extremely bored these days. Man has become so evil uh, that there is no more any excitement in tempting and drawing man to sin. Uh, uh, he says, I wish you had not given this man this light of reason that you call his intelligence and freedom of will because he is using it to become more animal than the animals. So man is using reason to become more beastly than the beasts. And I'm so bored, I'm so bored, there's nothing to do, there's nothing, there's no excitement, the Tom and Jerry excitement is lacking in his life. So Satan is, 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 is complaining to God and God tells him, well, you know, you're always complaining. And this is one of the uh, in, uh, the, the, the interesting uh, approaches of Faust, we'll talk about this more, that uh, the devil always complains. He's always negative. He's always uh, protesting. Whereas uh, the, the followers of God are always grateful, are always uh, worshipping, are always, you know, uh, glorifying God. So, uh, and God tells him, okay, you're bored. Uh, if you want to try somebody to tempt him, try Faust, not Job, but Faust. And I tell you that uh, no matter what he does, at the end he is mine. In other words, at the end he will not succumb to you. And at the moment of his death, uh, he will be mine. And this is the pact, this is the agreement between God and the Satan. Uh, Satan has the right to give everything. This is not the suffering this time, but we're going to go into the actual luxuries. He's going to give Faust everything that Faust wants, provided that at the end of his life, Faust would give his soul to God, uh, to, to, to Satan. In other words, he will go to hell and he will, not, uh, he will abandon or he will reject God. And God tells him, you know, uh, a man in his right path will never go astray. And I have confidence that Faust will never uh, give in. And in the meantime, man must fall, man must make mistakes. But in the process of making mistakes, he learns. So this is the first pact that takes place, the first agreement, if you want to, that Faust is going to be tempted by Satan, by Mephisto, uh, into rejecting God through not suffering, but actually through fulfilling all his dreams. So it is a, a, a kind of, it's through pleasure principle that we're trying to attract uh, Faust. Uh, the second part of it uh, will go when uh, the Mephisto uh, will make as this time a pact with uh, Faust and he will tell him I will give you everything you want everything you want and I shall be your slave provided that when you die your soul comes to hell and you serve me there as my servant and the, uh, the catch of this second agreement is that if Faust says to any experience, stay, I don't want this to end, and I don't want anything more, then he loses his bet. If on the other hand, he is always wishing to have more and go on with more creative, more ambition, more uh, sort of uh, uh, avant-garde thinking of new things, 
when uh, Satan loses, Mephisto loses. And to cut a story short, uh, uh, at the end of his life, in spite of all the things that he has done wrong, uh, Faust wins the bet. When he dies, his soul is taken by the angels up to heaven. However, this is also a different, the end justifying the means. The end for uh, Faust is not to give up his soul to, to Satan, to Mephisto. And the, 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 and the end for Faust is never to say to a moment, I wish I could die now. That's, the, that's all I want. So he, it's, it's the constant striving and wanting to go on more and more and more. And therefore, anything that he does as means to this end is good. Anything that he does, regardless of whether morally it is right or wrong compared to our values, that contributes to the success of this bat in favor of Faust is good. So based on these two pledges and bets, the story starts. So what we are going to read from this is not the entire uh, book, as I said. We shall start with the prologue in heaven, where we have this agreement between uh, Mephisto, God and Mephisto. Then uh, we shall move into the uh, study of Faust, and we'll go over this more in details about how he is sick of studying and sick of books. He's a teacher, he's a professor at the university. He has his students and uh, he says, I am, this is the romantic in him, I'm yearning for nature and going out and sitting in the grass and closing the books and enough, you know, of all of this. And then comes in Mephisto and they make this agreement. And then the journey of Faust starts. So what is Faust asking for? Faust will ask for anything that a human being of his age, he must be somewhere in his mid-40s, you know, wants. First he wants youth, because he has never really experienced youth. He wants beauty. He wants virility. He wants to be a man who is uh, sexually attractive to women. He also wants love. And this is where we will come to read the story of Gretchen, uh, Margaret, or Gretchen as he calls her, and the tragedy of Gretchen that happens here, because although he loves her, but if he stays with her, he loses the bet. So he has, he has to go on. And then in the second part of, the, uh, of, of Faust, we start Faust uh, looking for bigger dreams, not more only individuals. So people, when they have everything at the personal level, love, beauty, money, wealth, virility, they start wanting to get into politics. And they want power. And then they want science. It means they want to go into science and innovations, into art, into technology, into conquering the entire world. And once that is given to Faust, he wants to conquer the other world. Today, maybe it's space, but in the 19th, 18th, 20th century, 18th century, maybe it was to conquer the history and the past. Now, it's not Margaret that he wants to meet. It's Helen of Troy and historical figures and even he wants to conquer geography and start. This is a time when the Suez Canal is starting. This is a time when the, when the, when the canals are being built. This is where colonization. He starts thinking of conquering the entire world. So the limit of man's wanting and wanting never ends. And Mephisto is, is going crazy with Faust's constant asking for more. And the moment he asks for more, he keeps on his bet uh, winning. Now, let me just go back a little bit and look at the, what are the things that have, okay, a little bit about Goethe himself. 
Goethe was, uh, he grew up in Germany. He was a brilliant young kid. And his mother used to tell him lots of stories, especially with puppet shows. So he was very much into this theater thing. And the play, it's a play, you know, what we are reading. But this play has been made into a ballet. It has been made into uh, different uh, productions and uh, uh, even, even operas and music, you know. And therefore, uh, Faust has become the famous uh, uh, character that is shown always in, also in puppet shows. Uh, he went to university and he studied uh, law, and, uh, but mostly he was interested in studying life real life, experiencing life. Uh, uh, one of the things that we also want to see is what are the, what are the, the sort of influences that have affected uh, Goethe in this fantastic uh, volume of uh, uh, poetry and theater and art. Uh, let me tell you that whatever is Dante for the Italians, Goethe is for the Germans. He is the, the poet par excellence. He is their national epic, if you want to. And um, this is why most of the cultural centers or all the cultural centers of the German embassy are called the Goethe Institute. Uh, what are the things that have shaped over the years, his work, because this is, as I said, over 50 years. He was 81 when he finished it. He was in his 30s when he started it. The first thing was this romanticism. This romantic feeling, which was very much now uh, starting in the, in the 18th century and continued to the mid-19th, was a kind of rebellion against anything which was rational. Uh, a return to experience, feelings, emotions, sensations, uh, drawing things as they are, uh, painting people in the nude rather than, um, and then uh, experiencing, uh, you know, enough of the rational uh, part dominating the appetites, let the appetites come out, let them, let them uh, express themselves. And uh, we see this romantic feeling, uh, of course, one of the best expressions is love, uh, but also it appears in, in music, in art, in painting, in, in a little bit of being, uh, you know, liberty, you know, um, living life, uh, even the values become relative, even the concepts of right and wrong, some of the things that he does are shocking to us. And if we compare them to what Kant and Mill will say about them, they are immoral, yet, if the end justifies the means, and the end is, is to save his soul, which is more important, to save his soul or to uh, have a few victims on the way, like Gretchen or Philemon, as we shall see uh, the story of this uh, young uh, old couple who are sacrificed so that their land can be taken. So one of the influences is romanticism. Another major influence is pantheism. Goethe was very religious, but his religion is of his own understanding. Uh, and there is a lot of this religion of pantheism. Pantheism, it means God is everywhere. Uh, a little bit like the Sufists, if you want to, because there is mysticism also in it. But this is God is everywhere, and therefore religion is everywhere. And therefore, when he's going out with Gretchen and she says, uh, don't you go to church? He says, uh, I pray whenever, you know, I have my own, my own brand of religion, my own brand of what is right and wrong. But for him, one of the most interesting concepts was that his view of God, uh, if, you, if you remember, Hai called God the necessary being. If Faust was going to call or define God, he would call him the creative, the creator. If God is a creator, and if we have been created, human beings, in the image of God, then God wants us to be creative. Then God wants us to be active. 
then God doesn't like idleness. Idleness is a sin of the, of the devil. God wants us all the time to be moving and going on forward and never stopping. And therefore, based on this concept, based on this uh, uh, interpretation of the divine, for him, the good Christian or the good believer or the one who is in the straight path is the one who is constantly moving. Therefore, it is man the doer rather than man the knower who is important for Faust. We have talked about homo sapien. Homo sapien is what we are. They have defined us as homo sapiens because we are the sapiens sapere means in Latin to know. So if we are the sapere, we are the knowing people, it means that reason dominates us. Faust also, uh, Goethe was also very much impressed, not with the knowing man, because man should be educated, but with the homo faber, the one who works. The word faber, which means to do, fabrica, uh, fabricate, to do things, is the person who acts. And therefore, a man is measured not by what he knows, but what that knowledge is translated into action. That even when we first see him sitting in his study, he opens the book of John, which is what we read in the beginning of the semester, John 1. And it says, in the beginning was the word. And he says, oh, I want to rephrase it. In the beginning was the deed. So he thinks that at the beginning it wasn't the word or the, the actual logos or the logic, but it was the action. So this was one of the interesting things in his view of, um, of religion. The other interesting view that he had was that modern man, which is the Precursor, and by the way, this Homo Faber is going to really uh, affect a number of philosophies that we shall see in IS 205. It will affect Nietzsche, who very much believed that uh, we are constantly on the move, that man is a rope between animal and superman, and it is up to you to go either up or you go down. Now, either you become an animal and stay an animal, or you improve by constantly creating new values, by creating new ideas. So this concept of modern man of, of Faust, uh, of, of Goethe, is very much this Faustian element that we shall see that man should constantly strive, man is constantly on the go, even if you make mistakes, it doesn't matter because eventually you stand up and you continue. It's this myth of Sisyphus that we shall see with Sartre coming in existentialism, that a man pushes up a boulder every day until it reaches the top of the mountain. It topples back down. It doesn't matter. We start all over again the next day. I think the Lebanese understand this very well, this resilience and constant perseverance of going on and on. And then there is this new element that uh, is a bit shocking for us, but after having read Machiavelli, nothing shocks us anymore, is this relative values that he has. Uh, the relative values, in other words, actions, individual actions in themselves, are only measured insofar as how much they contribute to the larger picture. If the larger picture succeeds, then these individual sacrifices are worth uh, just uh, having them. So if, if he loves this young girl, her name is Gretchen, and if this Gretchen is uh, going to be sacrificed and even go to jail at the end, uh, but if the other alternative is that he stays with her and marries her and loses his bet with Mephisto and goes to hell, then no there are things which are uh, more important. So treating humanity as an end is not very much in his line. It is 
what is the, the same way as Machiavelli, they wanted the prince to stay in power. And whatever does uh, happen in the course of these uh, events to maintain his power is good. The same thing, anything that Faust does that allows him to win the bet with Mephisto is good. So these relative values we are going to be discussed a little bit, uh, uh, and we'll talk about them in the text. Now, uh, one of the things that also uh, is interesting here, and we shall talk more about this, is that uh, in the first uh, study that, uh, the, that we have, and we, uh, we will read it, we find that uh, he is totally, uh, you know, suffocating with education. Now, that's not a good thing to say as we are in the university, but that's probably how you feel after the end of the semester. I'm sick, he says. I have degrees in law, in theology, in, in, in philosophy. I have studied every single thing under the skies, and I still think I'm as ignorant as ever. What I want to do is I want to feel life. I want to live life in its best form. And therefore, he says, I've spent all my life being a professor in the university, advising students how to think rationally, but I've never lived. I've never experienced emotions. I never loved. I never had these feelings. And I don't want just emotions that are pleasant. I want, as Mill said, tranquility and excitement. I want the ups and downs. I want to feel everything. And when he says that, Mephisto tells him, oh, so now you want to be a little god on earth. You want to be everything. You want to be a microcosmos and feel everything. And he says, yes, I want to feel every single emotion. I want to have it all. So we will go through these uh, readings uh, and we will, I will accompany you uh, together through it. Uh, and uh, as we go through them, uh, we will zoom. I have already posted for you the pages you shall be reading from your uh, uh, PDF that's downloaded. And we will have this discussion also in relation with the other texts. Thank you, and thanks for your patience.